Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus and welcome to another analysis video. If you enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. On the agenda tonight, we're going to be taking a look at Frank Marino and more specifically the trailer for his new DVD Blu-ray box set, which has come out recently. And he's also going to join us on the analysis tonight. If the sound is slightly different, it's because we have Frank on the line and we're going to be talking across the internet. So we're going to be breaking it down as normal with an analysis video. I'll be stopping the trailer at particular points and we'll be getting Frank's input on some of the things that I'm mentioning. Another thing is that because of the software that we're using, when Frank talks, a picture will come up on screen and it will split from this feed that you're seeing at the moment. So don't panic if it suddenly changes to a picture on screen and then changes back to me. It's just the way that the software works. But we've already said hi to each other, so we're not going to go through that all again. We're going to jump straight into looking at the trailer, and then I'll jump in, as I normally do, and we'll get into the analysis. I'm just gonna jump in here. I will be jumping into this trailer quite a lot because there are plenty of things to point out. But first of all, we can hear that Frank is using the Wawa pedal with this lead section that we've just got into. And Frank, I'd like to ask you whether when you use the Wawa pedal in certain situations, it's gonna be part of a composition and something that is pre-planned, but then also how you use that Wawa in extemporized sections and as and when you go to that, whether it's pre-planned or whether it's just something that you feel like doing or a mixture of the two? Well, the wah-wah pedal is an interesting device. It's one of the oldest devices that guitarists have used from way, way back in the day. At one point, all they had was a wah-wah pedal and then some fuzz tones that came you know, along with that. But the wah-wah pedal is a device that I think in the beginning most guys who are using them as they as they begin their careers it's almost like it becomes almost like a crutch yeah it's almost like i'm going to do a solo and therefore i'm going to turn on this wah wah pedal and i'm going to move it back and forth and it's just going to make me sound like i'm doing more notes than i'm doing and it's going to be more expressive and people will go wow what's that <laughs> and i think what happens to a lot of kids that do that happened to me when i was starting um, is that it becomes that crutch that then they have to go to the wah-wah pedal to play the solo. Yeah. It's sort of like that with a delay. A lot of guitar players are maybe not as confident as they let on, and so they'll use delay because it kind of fills up the gaps and takes away the clicking notes that might have been missed or whatever and yeah. sounds pretty impressive. But then they become it becomes a crutch, and then they can't really play with delay without delay and it's the same for the wah-wah pedal so that's the beginning of using the wah-wah pedal what i now do is and with delay as well is a totally different thing the wah-wah pedal is basically going to allow me to express um let's say a crying kind of sound a, an emotional kind of sound that you can't necessarily get unless you're changing the frequency range by moving your foot. Yeah. And there's two ways to do that. You can do it by running over to the pedal because you just feel like you have to do it because that's basically what I do do. I, I, I never walk over to the wah-wah pedal and say, oh, I think I'll turn on the wah-wah pedal now because that'll be cool. Yeah. It's really like, I, I, I'm, oh, I have to press this now because I want to express it that way. It's almost like a grunt, you know, like pushing a, pushing a crate and then you grunt as you push it. That's that extra push. Yeah. And so I'll, I'll turn the pedal on and do something with it. And I'm trying to make the expression happen. It's not just going wah, 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 mm -hmm. but it's trying to make vowels. Is trying to make sounds with it. Open it a little, open it a lot, open, close it down a little. And if it's talking back to me, because music is a conversation, it's not a monologue, it's a dialogue. And it can be a dialogue between the artist and his gear. 
actually, and the gear and artist and his audience. And on some days you find it literally is inspiring you. In mm. other words, it's talking back to you, it's making suggestions, and that makes you take the song in a, in a different direction. Yeah. But some days it doesn't for some reason. And when that happens, I close the pedal. So <laughs> I just stop using the pedal because mm. it starts to become a distraction. The other way of doing it is I don't, I don't like being stuck to the pedal board where I can't walk or move. My foot is planted in one position. I uh, almost feel like if I take it off, I'm going to fall off a mountain. Mm. So I built an envelope follower, which is an automatic wah-wah, let's put it this way, yeah. which opens up as you pray, play hard on the string and doesn't open up if you play soft with your pick. Mm. So now I can use my dynamics. For instance, we do a song called Something's Coming Our Way. And on the record, on what's next, it was a wah-wah pedal. But when we do it live, I don't want to run over and have to be locked into doing that. So I built an envelope follower that I can turn on. And then when I'm in the middle of the stage where my pedal board doesn't even exist, I can still get the wah-wah effect by how dynamically I play. Mm. And that's almost a better way of do, using the wah-wah pedal because now it really is following your physical movements of your hand and how hard you're striking the guitar. It's, it's almost like making emphasis. So that's really my, my uh, approach to it. You'll notice in this whole show, I pretty much don't use the wah-wah pedal except for a couple of times. Yeah. Whereas in the old days, man, I was locked into that pedal every time I did a solo until I became more confident about what I had to say and felt, you know, I don't really need to hide it behind the wah-wah pedal. And something else that I just want to throw in there about the wah wah pedal, the way that it's used for phrasing and like you said, almost talking, getting the guitar to talk and you're having a conversation with the music effectively. A lot of people, when they first start out, they wah wah to the beat and they, right. can't, they can't stop doing that. And it's something that everyone falls into. I think the first person that I listened to and the first person that I ever listened to playing guitar was Jimi Hendrix. And the way that he used the wah-wah pedal was so freeform that right. it sounded like a voice. And it was, yeah. it was totally separate to anything the drummer was doing. Um, Mitch Mitchell, by the way, just again, if you're gonna listen to a drummer for the first time, he's a hell of a one to pick. But having that expression in there that's totally separate to rhythm, I think gave me an appreciation pretty early on that what this guy is doing sounds totally different to everybody else that's using the wah-wah pedal. And I think the way that you explained it is really accurate in terms of when everyone starts using the wah-wah, I would have been the same. You just start stomping on it in a, in a <laughs> perfect beat to whatever you're, if you are Well, let me, take, let me take you back to the beginning. I was there when the guys, when, when Jimi Hendrix first used the wah-wah pedal. He was also one of the first guitar players that I heard do it. Yeah. But prior to him having done that, Eric Clapton had used it on Disraeli Gears, mm. um, on, uh, on uh, Tales of Brave Ulysses. And uh, Jeff Beck had used it uh, on, um, uh, I don't remember the name, Ain't Superstitious, when he had Rod Stewart in the band. Yeah. Now, if you listen to those to both of those um, performances, particularly Tales of Brave Ulysses, Clapton is going wah, 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 wah in time with the song. He's mm -hmm. doing exactly what you just described. Yeah. Beck, on the other hand, is doing it when he's playing his solo. He's doing what I just described, where he's turning it on and playing fast, and the wah, -wah makes it sound like it's going faster. But yeah. Beck is using it to try to imitate a barking dog. So, you know, they, they say, I hear the dogs bark all around my neighborhood. And he goes, wow, wow, wow. He's trying to make the bow wow sound of a dog. So he's trying to use it to, as a kind of expressive device. But once he gets going on the solo, he too is just sort of stomping on it. Yeah. When Hendrix came along, the big thing at the time for us, having heard Clapton and, you know, have, having heard Disraeli Gears, all of a sudden Hendrix came out and he did... Um, up from the skies, which is a jazz kind of piece on Axis Bold as Love. 
And hearing that with the little double expressions that he's doing was almost like, whoa, no one had ever used it that way before. Yeah. But when he finally came out and really used it on Still Raining, Still Dreaming, which is Rainy Day, Dream Away, mm, yeah. he brought it to such a level that you, to this day, there isn't a guy around that can invent that sound again, that can make that do that. Yeah. It's so expressive that it's just, you know, everyone tries to do wow, what wow, but yeah. they never quite get it right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just so expressive. Now I know how to do that because I know that style. So I can actually do that. As a matter of fact, we used to cover that tune mm. and it, and it did sound proper. He's using it in that sort of expressive way of like, let's make it be another instrument into itself rather than just sort of make my guitar sound like it's going wah, wah, wah. Yeah. So there you have it. And I think Hendrix used it better than anybody. Yes, I agree with you on that. Let's jump back into the trailer and we'll resume the analysis when I next jump in. I'm just going to jump in here again to point out the way that Frank stretches over two frets sometimes with that second finger, because it's something that's come up on the channel a few times in the comment section where people have watched my playing and they've said that I shouldn't be stretching over two frets with that second finger. I should be doing that with a third finger in terms of playing the most efficient way. But I always answer the same way that you have to play the guitar for your own physiology. So something that I want to ask you, Frank, is when you are playing and you're making those stretches, is it something that is just happening naturally? And is the fingering in terms of how you're playing particular phrases something that happens naturally and you're not necessarily thinking about the fingers that you're using to play a particular phrase? Interestingly, of course, it all happens naturally now, but mm -hmm. using it as an analysis, okay, like if I have to analyze me, because I also produce artists, so I sometimes have to analyze them. Mm -hmm. And I treat, when I produce my own records, I, I actually treat myself as if I'm another guy. I, I, I literally say, you know, okay, Frank is doing this, <laughs> you know, when I'm, when I'm mixing the song. So I can analyze Frank that way. But here's what actually happens think about the guy that said to you, no, 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 you should always use the third finger, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say he's doing that trill, we'll call it a trill, yeah. between the fifth fret and the third fret of his guitar. So he's playing in the key of G on the D yeah. string, and he wants to trill that G, F, F, G, F, G, F, G, right? Yeah. And he's saying you should always use the third finger. Well, he's only right because there's a big space between the two frets. But if you're up high, they're closer together, and then the third finger becomes a hard thing to use. Yeah. Go, let's go back down to the first position. That same trill, if now instead of F and G, the song calls for a trill between F and F sharp, he wouldn't possibly be using his third finger then. He'd use his second finger, yeah. right? And no one would do it F, F sharp with their first and third finger. So really, it becomes a question of the distance. If you if you are if you're playing if your hand is a certain size, and your natural spacing between your two fingers of one and three, index and ring finger, is exactly the spacing between the two frets. Why not use those? Yeah. But if it's exactly the spacing between the first and second fret, then use those. And let's say it was a four fret trill you definitely wouldn't be using one and three. You'd be using one and four yeah. to make that happen, or maybe even two and four, okay? Yeah. But it's really a question of the size. Now, since the graduation of a guitar neck is such that the frets become closer and closer together as you get to the top, you're going to see uh, one, three positions down at the low sides of the neck, but you're not going to see one, three positions if I'm playing in the second octave. Then it might be the two positions because it's easier to do that without stretching any of your muscles. Mm -hmm. And everything that I do on a guitar, no matter what it is, has to be easy. Mm -hmm. It should never be hard. Yeah. If it is hard and I have to do it, I'll do it. But if it's if there's an easy way to do it, you know, physically, I'll pick the easy way mm -hmm. because the less you have to think about the fact that you're controlling an instrument, that there's a thing fighting back against you, 
uh, the better you're going to be able to express. I often say that I play a form of air guitar on an actual guitar. Mm. I have extremely light strings. I have an extremely slim and thin neck. So when I'm playing guitar, I literally don't feel a lot of pushback. Mm. So it's almost like I'm playing air guitar. So if I start using fingers that are going to force me to stretch that I shouldn't, or squeeze my fingers together when I don't want to, that's just going to make me have to think about the fingers and not simply be in the zone, figuring out what I want to express musically from my mind. Yeah. So there's no right way and wrong way. And if there is a right way, it's use the way that is the least resistance. Yeah, it's a really good point and an important point of saying there's no right way, there's no wrong way. I've seen sometimes with the typical major scale stretch that you might have on your B string and your high E string of instructional DVDs that are playing it first third and then the gap between third and the fourth finger is that two fret gap. And for me personally, having smaller hands, my natural hand position, when it's relaxed, my first finger would sit over that first fret, but then my second finger, not my third finger, is in a more comfortable position to then get that two fret gap higher up, which means yeah, exactly. yeah. that is my own physiology. And having my hand relaxed over the top of the guitar, and as a teacher, this is what I tell people, is that having your hand in a relaxed position, stretch it out and just see which finger is closest to the note that you want. And that's the one oh, you use. 100% correct. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. It, it must be relaxation first and whatever accomplishes that. So another technique that some guys make a mistake with is consider the guy that likes to hold his guitar down very low. Yeah. He's forcing his wrist to bend. Yeah. So now he's going to be much harder for him to accomplish some of the things that we accomplish if we hold the guitar higher and then your wrist becomes almost straight with the back of your hand. Yeah. There's no joint in it, no bend in it like that. Yeah. So that's another thing to consider. Whatever makes it easy. You know, there's a reason that classical guitar players place their classical guitar on their left leg and put yeah. their foot up on a stand. Yeah. That's because it forces the elbow away from the body doesn't squeeze your bicep against your chest and it forces your wrist to become very, very flat and not bent in a, in a bent direction, which loosens up all your ligaments. Yeah. So whatever keeps you loose do. Yeah. And I have small hands too. Mm. So my whole technique is like you said, whatever fingers there, that's the one that should do it. Because yeah. if I have to twist my arm around to get some other one to do it, I'm just, uh, I'm basically, now I'm not expressing anymore. I'm thinking about, uh oh, how do I do this? You know, yeah. uh, I guess a mogul, a mogul skier that really does it well, just slides down the hill. But the, when he has to think about every mogul, uh oh, here comes another one. I better twist. I better bend. He's not going to complete the, the course in the same time as the other guy that's got smooth lines. Yeah, it's a really interesting thing to look out for with other players that you mentioned who have the guitar strung very low in terms of almost playing round at their ankles. As yeah. soon as there is any solo section, and just the guitarist that's popped into my mind is Slash, whenever there's a more technical solo section, he puts his leg up and gets the base of the guitar on his thigh so that the guitar neck is now in the typical classical position. Correct. So he can play these phrases more fluidly and therefore express himself on the fretboard in that more comfortable position. So there is an argument for that, that theoretically he might be doing it just because looking cool, having it you know, really low down. Yeah. That's something that goes with the image. But then when you get to the real detail of playing and expressing, he wants yeah. to get that guitar in a very particular position. And Absolutely. That's, yeah, that's that trade-off point between looking cool and actually making an artistic point and being very musical. You need to get everything, as you said, so easy and subconscious that you're not wrestling anything. You can just have the conversation with the audience through the instrument and nothing's going to get in the way of that. But let's jump back into the trailer and we'll resume the analysis in a second.
I'm just gonna jump in here again. Something that I wanna put the spotlight on is singing and playing at the same time. It's something that I mention on this channel all the time about it doubling the difficulty. And when you're playing riffs and singing, I think that difficulty can get ramped up even more. So Frank, I'd like to know your approach to playing and singing at the same time, how you go about doing it for live performance, and whether you attribute particular notes with beats or vocal phrases you might be singing, or if it's just something that you play subconsciously on the guitar and then free that up in order to then focus on the vocal. Well, in my case, it's a little bit different because virtually every song I've ever done in the, in the studio that has become live songs, um, the wasn't done vocal first. So the vocal melodies that I'm singing were actually done on the guitar. Mm. And then later it was okay. Now take off that guitar melody and sing what yeah. I just played. So it's very natural. Mm. Where it comes where where it comes in handy for me is that I'm a drummer. Yeah. So having a little bit of syncopation ability to do one thing while the other limb is doing the other is kind of natural for me. Mm. But when I get a guy that that doesn't quite get that. And he's, you know, he's trying to say, well, I can't, it's hard for me to sing that part and still play those chords in that rhythm. Yeah. One time I had someone I was producing and he was having, he was a drummer actually. And <clears throat> he was having a little trouble with that idea of time. Mm. And I said to him, well, let's just take a break and we'll go down the street, get ourselves a cup of coffee. And as we walked down, I did it on purpose. And I'll show you why. As we went down the street, we, you, when you walk down the street, you walk at a certain pace, depending on the time of day, if it's cold, if it's warm. So we're walking at a relatively leisurely pace to go about a quarter of a mile. Mm. And while we were doing that, because I'm also a drummer, and he's a drummer, you know, when you walk down the street, you can take your hands and you can tap on your chest, like, yeah. you know, make beats on your chest as you walk and you can hear them, right? So I started talking about the Beatles because we both knew the Beatles very well. We weren't playing Beatles songs in the record we were doing, but he's a Beatles fan, I was a Beatles fan. So I start talking about the Beatles and I go, oh, how about that song? And I mentioned Nowhere Man. And how about that song? I mentioned Strawberry Fields and I mentioned Penny Lane and a bunch of different Beatles tunes. And you're, we're walking down the street, tapping on our chest, tapping out Beatle tunes. And every one of them's different. Some are slow Beatle tunes, some are fast Beatle tunes, but we never stop walking at a certain speed. Yeah. So then I stopped him and I said, you notice how we just did a bunch of Beatle tunes in completely different rhythm to our walk and it didn't screw up your walk and your walk didn't screw up your tunes? Yeah. He goes, yeah, I hadn't thought about it. I said, that's the key. You hadn't thought about it. Hmm. So the idea is to get the body, the rhythm guitar, if you're playing chords, you're playing some, so I play funk sometimes or I play soul music, like James Brown type of stuff. Hmm. When you're playing rhythm a certain way, a lot of ninth chords, yeah. and you're, 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 you're giving it some rhythm. And then I got to sing something that's a kind of a counterpoint time to that. But I just get the body to do what the walk would do. Yeah. It becomes just a natural walk, and then the voice is free to do whatever you like. You're re literally disconnecting it. Yeah. The only problem is if you begin to watch it. <laughs> yeah. You get to watch it, it'll, it'll get out of sync. Yeah. So you have to go outside of yourself. You have to project outside. Don't think inside. Hmm. And, and one of the best ways of doing that is, and I often say this to singers, if you're singing, imagine you're actually singing to a person. Hmm. Put a, a mental face in front of you while you sing the line. And they're, they're looking back at you with a, like an expression on their face, like what? You know? And you're singing out to them. And you won't notice that your hands are doing the other thing. Get yeah. outside of yourself rather than inside of yourself. That's how I accomplish that. Let's get back into the trailer and then we'll jump in again for the next analytical point.
I'm just going to jump in there again. I'm going to bring up the subject of vibrato or vibrato, depending on where you're from. But it's something that I mention on my channel all the time. In terms of the expression that each player has, I personally think that it's one of the techniques, if not the most important technique in expression, individuality, and getting a player's identity across through the playing. So in terms of this, Frank, and the technique when you use it, are you particularly thinking about vibrato when you're applying it? Or is it more of a feeling that you're going on? Is it a subconscious thing that is automatically linked in with your expression as to how you want it to sound and how you change your vibrato depending on the mood of the particular track you're playing at the time? Vibrato is the, is the dark art. <laughs> the, the dark art of making music in, in any instrument. Hmm. So consider this, in, in most forms of music, vibrato can be expressed in a lot of forms, not most, but many. It can be expressed in two ways. It can be expressed in pitch modulation or dynamic modulation. One is called tremolo. Yeah. So a twin reverb that has a tremolo vibrates the note by making it louder and quieter without changing its pitch. Mm and choruses vibrate the note or the other kind of vibrato is where you're saying the pitch is going down up down up down up or up down up down up down right in the pitch one that's the one we mostly deal with with guitar yeah in singing we can do both so when i'm singing a line i can i can do a line like for instance uh, some jazz singers and simply change the dynamic ah, 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 without bending the note, mm. or I can change the pitch, ah, 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 as, you know, while bending the note. Yeah. But with guitar, you can't really do it tremolo. Mm. It's all about pitch because we're bending a string. Now you can use a pedal to create tremolo type vibrato, which I sometimes do a volume pedal to create a vibrato sound. <laughs> And it sounds like vibrato, but it's tremolo. But most of the time, 99% of the time, we're dealing with pitch. The question becomes this. When you, when you think of a sine wave, you have the positive and negative wave, and you have a center. Yeah. Let's imagine that that center is perfect pitch. We can bend above the perfect pitch and below the perfect pitch, in the case of a tremolo arm on a guitar. With a finger, you can't really go below the pitch you first started with. You can either go above it and back to normal, or you could start on another note, bend up to the one you want to go to, and then use down, up, down, up, down, up. You can bend up to the one you want to go to and use up, down, up, down, up, down, vibrate sharp. Hmm. And then the other thing is the speed of it. Are they, should they be fast? Should they be slow? Should they be a combination of fast into slow, which I often do, mm. or slow into fast? Or should they start at the beginning of the note and last, or should they wait and then only be tagged on to the end of a note? You see how many variations now there are to vibrato. This is why I call it a dark art. Yes. You have to sort of get used to, in a second nature way, first of all, with all of the different permutations. That's where the practicing comes in. Yeah. Practicing what you don't know how to do till you do, and then it's second nature. Once you've done that, you'll find that your expressiveness will increase exponentially because you'll automatically use all of the techniques at different times based on the background music that you're playing to. Yeah. So I'm not going to start vibrating an, a held note if there's a beautiful major seven chord yeah. that I want people to hear behind me and I'm playing a note along with it that, let's say, isn't the major seven. It's mm. maybe the fifth. Because I will begin to put a note into that chord by bending it that doesn't belong in the chord. Yeah. 
So I'll create a dissonance that maybe doesn't make it as pretty. So in that case, you want to hold that note and then maybe tag on that little bit of vibrato bend when the chord is dying out. Yeah. It's a flavor. Now, it sounds like I'm overanalyzing this, and I am. But once you've done this and made it all second nature, you will automatically do those things. So some chords you're going to bend sharp on purpose. Yeah. And some chords you're going to bend flat on purpose or bend up and then use the flat form of vibrato. Mm. One of the things largely misunderstood about our friend Jimi Hendrix, mm. when people try to, for instance, do the beginning of All Along the Watchtower, which is a very, very beautiful uh, lead solo entrance into the song, very iconic. You know, when he does that, da, 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 da. Yes, okay, uh, very well. Well, if you go and look at that, you'll find that Hendrix often bends above the note, mm. he pushes them sharp, he'll bend up to a note and push a little higher. Yeah, most guitar players will push up to the note and then relax and come back, relax and come back, they're bending lower. Yeah, but you'll also notice that he doesn't do it all the time. Yeah. And there's a perfect example of a guy who's doing all of the techniques, as I've said, but doesn't even know he's doing them because they're second nature. Yeah. And they're fitting in at the right time. So to the guitar players who are out there, if you go through my DVD, for instance, you're not, believe me, you're not going to see the same vibrato all the time in all the songs. Yeah. You're going to go, oh my goodness, you know, Frank's bending sharp there. Oh my goodness, Frank didn't bend there. Oh my goodness, he's got it going it flat there. Mm. Hey, how come he's vibrating quickly, but in the other song he vibrated really slowly? Mm. It's just it's a it's a dark art that has no real rule except familiarize yourself with the different expressions and then get out of the way <laughs> again <laughs> and let them express. And let's get back into the trailer and we'll resume the analysis after. I'm just going to jump in there just to bring up the topic of groove because it's something that is prevalent in all of Frank's performances. And I think being a drummer, he certainly got a deep appreciation of it. And I'm going to throw this one into your court, Frank, in terms of trying to explain what groove is also, as a musician, what to look out for, how to achieve a groove as a band and how important it is to have because it can make or break a particular track if you haven't got the right groove. Well, it's like I said before, timing is everything, not just melody. And groove is, is, is based on timing. Hmm. And it's how do you know the groove is good? You know the groove is good when you feel hypnotized. Yeah. It's kind of a hypnosis. It just feels good. You, you, I think it's very hard to groove if, or to make music groove if it's, let's say, uh, if the instruments are fighting each other. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain syncopation. Well, let's take a drummer, for instance, who's without a band. He's playing the groove, okay, that, are, that everyone's playing to. Yeah. Now, he can look at it as if he's playing a set of drums, or he can look at it as if the set of drums itself is an orchestra. Mm. 
If the set of drums is looked at as an orchestra, start looking at it as sections. You've got your cymbal section and your tom section and your kick section, your snare section. Imagine that. There's a symbiosis, there's a synchronicity to how you're going to make those things play and when they're going to come in. So a great drummer like Vinny Caliuta, for instance, will be playing a great groove behind Sting. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he'll just throw in a da-dong tom, you know? Just a tom that comes out of nowhere. Yeah. It's that little blast that goes in there. And then once in a while, next time around, he maybe he does it with a hi-hat or he does something a little different. Mm. This is creating a kind of a hypnosis. And then the people that play to that, they move to it. It starts to move. Mm. So groove is like a really beautifully moving ocean. <laughs> and when you lose that groove, it's like a, a, a hailstorm in the ocean and the waters are all over the place. Okay. The boats are getting tossed. Yeah. You want it all to be really smooth and it can be fast. It can be slow. It can be medium. It doesn't have to be funk. It can be, it can be a hypnotic line. Like when we do strange universe on the, on the thing, and it goes over and over again. Yeah. There's a hypnosis to that. And that's what the groove is. The groove is, is it pulling me? Is the music pulling me into hypnosis so that, again, I don't have to be the center of attention. I'm riding this beautiful machine, hmm. and it just feels good to ride the machine. Yeah. How do you do that? Everyone says it's great to analyze it. How do you do that? Hmm. Well, you do that, again, I hate to say it, you stop trying so hard, hmm. and you listen to the spaces between what you're playing. Yeah. Those spaces are very, very, very important. I, I can't say how important they are. They're very, they're, if not more important than the actual notes. Dragonfly, as an example, has a lot of space in it. Yeah. And if you actually analyze that tune, the, the kick drum is just go boom, ba boom, chop, boom. Okay, that's what's doing. There's your basis. That's what it's built on. Now, what's going to happen in between there? Rule one, if you're producing records that have groove, remember this, this is a trick, but it works. If one guy's playing double time, the other guy should play half. Mm -hmm. If one guy's, if the drums are playing a fast beat with double hi-hats, then the other instruments should play single beats on the half time. Mm -hmm. But if the instruments are going do 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 then the drums should go boom, bang, boom, bang. What you don't want is two guitarists doing the same thing the same way. Yeah. And then the bass player too. And then the drummer too. Yeah. Then it's no good. So it's syncopation. The instruments in the band are like the spices in a meal. Mm. And the salt doesn't try to beat pepper. <laughs> you know, they each do their thing. Yeah. And they, the blending together is what makes the taste at the end. Some songs are easier to groove to because they're written in such a way that it promotes grooving. Yeah. I think the hardest kind of songs to find a groove in are really fast rock and roll tunes. Yeah. It's, how do you groove on that? Everyone's going, you know, there's no real groove on that. But if all of a sudden I had to play in a band that was playing that fast rock and roll, if I was producing it, I might tell one of the instruments to play in half time yeah. to give it a groovier feel. So why are we saying groove? We're saying groove because a groove is the middle of two mountains. It's the valley in between two peaks. Mm. It's the balance point. That's why it's called groove. Mm. And, and, and for instance, a record needle follows a groove. <laughs> it doesn't jump <laughs> over the groove, right? Yeah. So that's why we call it that. And, Musically, I think playing with really good guys who listen to you mm. and you listen to them, you'll groove. Yeah. It's when you get that one guy in the band that isn't listening, yeah. listening to his amp, yeah. then it's not going to groove. Yeah. He's not pulling together. It's uh, certainly a combined effort in terms of everyone singing from the same hymn sheet and not having any egos in the band. I think playing in a band, playing with other people, you've got to leave your ego, if you have one, at the door because yeah. groove is the first thing that is going to suffer 
when you want to show off what you can do. Correct, is- correct, yeah. absolutely. Gro- a, groove, a groove is the greatest example of the total being greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah. It's a perfect example of that. It's that magic that happens when everybody is really having a dialogue. Yeah. Not talking over each other, getting out of the way, don't get in the way of the singer, you know? Yeah. You can get a real great groove going. I used to listen to, when I was growing up, uh, I used to listen to a lot of soul music. Mm. I used to do a lot, a lot of rhythm and blues, R&B, and everything from Marvin Gaye, I mean, you name it, okay? Yeah. And these records had a lot of groove, whether Sly Stone or whatever. There was a lot of groove in these records. So, but my entire group of friends understood that. Yeah. It was, we even had the term groovy. Okay, it's like we even use we even use that as a term in those days. Hey, it's groovy, you know. I think Hendrix even says sit back and groove on a rainy day, yeah. right? So that was very much a part of our culture. Hmm. It wasn't foreign to us. So naturally, we're going to do music that tries to to do that. Today, they're not thinking about it so much. So we have to sort of tell them, well, here's how we did it. Yeah. And yeah, if you, if you watch my DVD, there's a lot of tracks that groove like that. But yeah. that's just not because we're trying. It's just because that's our culture. That's how we, yeah. we grew up doing it. Let's get back to the trailer and just watch it till the end. And we'll get back to the analysis after. And there we have it. The last point that I want to make really with this analysis is about vocals and putting the spotlight on your vocals, Frank, and how you achieve your vocal sound. Is there anything that you do exercise wise vocally? Is it something that you've always been able to do or had a propensity for or something that you've had to work at over the years? Well, for the first half of my career, if not longer, first half of the early career, I thought I could not sing. Mm. So consequently, my early albums, I talk my way through songs like Bob Dylan. Yeah. You know, like, I just like talk my way through it. You know? Yeah. I never felt confident in singing and they'd come into the studio and it's like, okay, you got to do your vocal track. I'd say, shut the lights, get everyone out. Please don't put the voice in solo. Make sure that the music is playing if you have to check it, you know? Yeah. But as time went on, I began to feel, you know, why am I doing this? I actually can sing because I would walk around the house singing and I would, I would, you know, I would sing songs and I actually could, Mm. but I would think that for some reason I couldn't when I started, you know, playing with the band. Yeah. I really had to sort of say to myself, okay, you're just going to sing. You're not. You're, it doesn't matter whether you're not the best singer. It doesn't matter whether, you know, because I'm not. I'm, I don't want to be judged by singers because I'm not really the best singer and I don't want to be. Mm. But I have to be able to at least express my music yeah. in my voice. Now, I'm not going to go, for instance, ever, if I'm covering a tune, I'm not going to go cover something by, let's say, Mr. Mister, where the guy's singing so high I can't do it. Yeah. Right? It would be crazy. But I'm going to, my voice is very much in the range of, let's say, a Greg Allman. You know, it's a bluesy kind of voice. It's not really a, a high tenor. It's mm-hmm. kind of baritone to mid tenor. And then I said to myself, well, I should be able to at least express with my voice what I'm expressing in my mind. Because if my hand can do it, my voice can do it. Yeah. And I just began to gain more confidence at it. Mm-hmm. And vocals, my daughter is a, is a classical soprano. And she teaches. And she'll tell you, as a, as a vocal instructor, the voice is all confidence. <laughs> yeah. If you're unconfident, you just can't do it. Yeah. So you have to almost talk yourself into being confident, and then you're able to do it. And yeah. that's what I had to do. 
I have to talk myself into being confident about it and then just trying it. And then I was mildly surprised that I can actually do this thing. Mm. So once I knew I could actually do it, I said, well, let's take it to greater and greater heights. Let's try this. Let's try that. I wasn't afraid anymore. Mm. But in the beginning, I was very afraid. Yes, I was. I think something that comes up on my channel a lot about singers and the classic comment is this artist, whoever it might be, was so lucky to be born with such a gift in terms of singing. And I think a lot of singers out there, especially guitar players, became singers through necessity, not through choice. Because Yes, that's my case. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I went through it with my band. We auditioned singers for two years and it got so long in the tooth we thought we're not actually doing anything apart from auditions so i decided right well i'm gonna try and learn how to sing and then you know further down the line it was okay and it worked out it means that i can now sing to a okay level where you know the music yeah. my expression comes across and that's the only only level really that i wanted to get to and another point that you made which was really important i think with singers and why people think they can't sing is singing where their voice sits and where their natural range is because right. so many people try and sing ACDC and mm -hmm. they're not a tenor and they think, oh, I can't sing because, you know, when I try and sing that, I sound like right. you know, a cat's being strangled or whatever. Again, <laughs> taking their eye off the ultimate goal of personal expression and that wasn't how you're meant to sing because you haven't got those vocal cords. It's not the way right. that your body has been made up. So I think it's a really important thing, especially, I mean, people will say about your voice that I'm sure they'll say you are so lucky to have such a naturally great voice, but we know that it's a confidence thing and that you had to work through believing that you could do it. The whole thing was that. The whole thing was that. It was about the confidence. I didn't even know it was about the confidence until I found out it was about the confidence. Yeah. But all the early albums, the very early albums where I'm literally talking through songs that I now play singing. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, I talked on the albums and now I do vocal versions of them that see, still sound like the talking version, but I'm actually going to pitches instead of just sliding around mountaintops. Yeah. You know? This is, this is what you, it all, it's just about confidence. And look, everybody's got gifts. Let's face it. There's some gifted guitarists and gifted vocalists and gifted all kinds of things. Mm. Here's the thing. And I said, I said this on another interview. If a person is gifted, there's no reason to applaud for them. Mm. Because <laughs> that would be like be applauding for someone that's handsome. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You, you, you want to applaud someone that works it out and does it in spite of the fact they may not have been as gifted. Yeah. And so they deserve all the applause in the world for working at it and getting themselves, because, because what one person can do, another person can do. Mm. I mean, assuming they have the same physical ability, you know, they have their arms or legs or whatever. So all it means is, do I want to do this? Or would I like to do this? And if I just like to do it, I'll never get it. But if I really want to, I will put in the time necessary and I'll start to become confident and I'll become adequate to express what I need to express. Mm. And that's as an artist, you know, you really only need what's adequate for you to express. I'm sure there are some painters who would love to have giant studios, mm. but they can still paint in their attic as long yeah. as they have the brushes and the ink and the easel. Yeah. They don't need the giant studio. They'd like to have it. And it's the same with us. As singers, we'd love to have the pipes. But if we don't, we have our pipes and we'll find our way to do our art on our easel with our paint yeah. and our brushes. And it'll be exclusively us. Mm. That's what we're giving people. We're giving them a window into who we are at a moment in time. And this is who I am. This is what I do. I really hope you like it. But this is what I do even if you don't like it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's it. That's it's giving people the choice to like yeah. it or not and not changing yourself to hope that they will like it more than what it, you do. Exactly. 
No. Exactly. We've been talking for a while, but I'd like to say a massive thank you to you, Frank, for joining me tonight and for discussing all of these things with me. And I'll definitely put the link in the description underneath this video when I upload it and also to the comment section so people can check out the Blu-ray and DVD box set. But hopefully in the future, we'll be able to link up again and maybe go through. No, we'll, we'll stay in touch, Phil. I mean, yeah. if you can, like, uh, link them to the trailer too so that they can see the trailer in its entirety, you know, if ever yeah. they want to. And uh, I just, you know... I, I'm so thankful to you for doing this. I think it's great. I think I believe totally in what you're saying, 100%. And let's do it again. Let's do it when I get the rights to, to show more of the tunes. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. Thank you so much for joining me, and I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. Phil, call anytime. Think, uh, write anytime. Let me know when it's going to play. I want to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Frank. Have a good night, man. Okay, and you, Frank. Thanks a lot. See you later. All right. Ciao. So, thank you guys for watching this video. A massive thank you to Frank again, just for making this a very special analysis video. And I'm sure that our paths are going to cross in the future. I'm going to probably edit what we did tonight into other videos because... We did actually talk for four hours about so many different things about the music industry, on stage setups, guitars, so much I had to take out of this particular video, but I'll edit those together probably into separate videos on different topics and I'll release those over on Patreon and I'll make sure that they get over to YouTube as well so you guys can check those out. I'm just amending the end of this video and slotting this in there because I want to say a few words about Frank's DVD and Blu-ray box set. I've watched it and there's six hours worth of material on there. When I was speaking to Frank earlier, he wanted to do even more, but he took breaks in the set. And I said that I think that was a wise choice because he didn't have any sleep going into such a long day. It was all filmed on the same day and he hadn't had any sleep. So it's an amazing performance with that taken into consideration, but it's an amazing performance anyway throughout the whole six hours there is so much in there that players can admire but just musically if you're looking for something to really get your teeth into all of the things that we've been through in this video so many elements and there are so many other things that we could talk about and that's why it would be great just to break down one song of frank's and a particular performance and really get into the nitty-gritty of the live performance and how it's all set up. A lot of people were saying when Frank was working on this that it's taking a long time, when is it going to be out? And the reason that it has taken the time it has is all included in the box set. You get a booklet in there and there is so much in there that is relatable from a musician's point of view, also just a hobbyist's point of view. If you do music on the side, it's so relatable, all the problems that Frank had and the extent of the problems as well. Because once you know what Frank has gone through in order to get his art out in front of people, it just demands massive respect and just shows you that Frank Marino is a true artist. In every sense of the word, there's not many people that would go through what Frank did to get his music in front of people. And that is the focus. I'm gonna put the link to the box set in the description below and also pin it in the comments so you guys can click on the link in order to get your hands on it. And I'll also include the link for the trailer that we've been analyzing tonight. So you guys can watch that all the way through and you can watch it as many times as you want to. But thank you so much for joining Frank and I tonight. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. And I'll see you guys at the next one. Rock.